there, I'm Brandi Lloyd, and you are listening to the Restore Path Podcast, a place for women over 40 who want to feel good, look good, and do good in the world, and not be burdened with chronic pain and fatigue. So today I'm answering the question, what happens next? I just received an autoimmune diagnosis. Oh boy, in this episode, I'm going to take a little bit of time and share my own personal firsthand experience in this area and point you in the direction of either managing, slowing the progress, or possibly even reversing your own autoimmune condition. So for those of you that don't know, here's my story. I never thought that I would have an autoimmune disease, let alone more than one. I spent a lifetime as an athlete, you know, a person who never failed at making time for exercise. Although I wasn't a clean eater to the point I am today, I was definitely on what most people would consider to be a quote unquote healthy eater based on what the general population and the teaching was told at the time. You know, I had a pretty much low fat diet, especially saturated fats. You know, I was one of those egg white only with veggies and whole grain toast kind of people. Our home didn't have butter. It had Smart Beat Smart Balance, which basically we know today is just yellow spreadable chemicals, almost like pure plastic. I cooked with canola oil and even bought reduced fat cheeses and salad dressings and ate white meat chicken, you know, with no skin on it. Uh, My favorite thing I considered uh, to really be my only consistent junk food was my coffee in the morning that I'd put a splash of non-fat vanilla creamer in it, you know, that coffee mate stuff. And during the holidays, I loved maybe once a week to get a Starbucks pumpkin spice latte, but with only one pump of syrup rather than the three plus that many people got in their standard serving. Um, you know, I was fairly low sugar. Uh, I often made uh, tofu and veggies for lunch or quinoa and could always find uh, some sprouted, very expensive bread in my fridge or freezer. I didn't drink soda nor eat red meat. I didn't even care for red meat. I didn't drink much alcohol, but when I did, it wasn't beer or sugary mixed drinks. It was often like a glass or two maybe of wine over the weekend. If we found ourselves in a bar or lounge of some kind, which was rare, I might have a vodka with lime and and club soda, but you know, drinking just wasn't my thing and neither was Um, you know, fast foods and that obvious kind of junk food, unhealthy stuff. As far as stress, I always started my day listening to a sermon and managing and trying to have a good uh, spiritual life. I, you know, tried to deal with my mental and emotional health by uh, making sure I had in the very, the early mornings, a quiet time journaling, reading my Bible, had an excellent marriage. I still do. Uh, My husband was entrenched in his law enforcement career, working 80 to a hundred hours a week, which included shifts all around the clock and running up and down the state. Um, I pretty much ran the household. I was involved in the kids' schools and sports, and I was working part-time in fitness. And eventually, I opened up my own gym, uh, which I tried to work in and around the family schedule. I had several people working for us. Uh, but even then, you know, I had very active sons who were three sport athletes. And, and you know, to say my life was busy was an understatement. But you know, I just didn't feel like it was. Um, I looked like a picture of health. I wasn't overweight. I didn't smoke. And, and I personally, I felt that I was a, a very small, I was in the very small disease risk category for sure. I trained hard and I played hard and I enjoyed it. Uh, there were times in training where I even traveled the country, uh, you know, chasing hardcore certifications or, or teaching them. So, you know, it's my life looked pretty darn good, but you know, I didn't really feel pretty darn good. Now, for most of my life, I have had unexplained like body pain, especially around my joints, you know, even as a child. Um, I saw um, acupuncturists and chiropractors and regular doctors, and no one really knew what the causes of these joint pains or aches really were. Um, I also suffered from, you know, seasonal allergies and digestive issues and, and some skin stuff like eczema. But, you know, this was just part of my normal life and, you know, everybody has stuff. And as I was growing up, it didn't stop me from riding bikes or horses or motorcycles. And it certainly didn't stop me from playing year round sports for most of my childhood. Um, even, uh, at the international level while playing on very busy, successful travel teams. But I tell you what, when I was about 38, 
And at the time of this recording, I'm about 49 and a half. Uh, when I was 38, things changed. I found that I was horrifically fatigued, not just tired. I mean, I was fatigued. My hair was falling out. My stomach was killing me every day in the afternoon. And sure, you know, I had body pain or weird things would come up with my shoulders, even though I was a personal trainer and I knew proper form. Um, I just thought, you know, and I still work out pretty hard and I'm running the gym and I'm teaching, you know, these 23 small group training classes a week and, you know, all of this and managing my own fitness schedule and, you know, trying to balance that and take care of my body and, and not do as much as I was, you know, training and teaching others, but it was still too much. The lowest of the low was when my speech would start to slur because of the fatigue. I would, I would hear it and I'd really have to concentrate on, on, on enunciating my words or that I felt actually uh, like nervous about driving that, um, I worried of how tired I was and if I could really pay attention when I was driving. Um, and then really the straw that broke the camel's back was when I was literally doubled over in pain. And at that point I was hoping, okay, there's gotta be parasites or I've got some weird virus or something going on. So I called my doctor and I went in for all the usual tests and labs and a shortest of a severe vitamin D deficiency, things look pretty good from a conventional medical standpoint. Uh, he just was like, you know, I don't think, you know, anything's wrong with you. Um, as far as, you know, um, bacteria, viruses, parasites, you know, things like that. But he was kind of one of those doctors that were on the fence straddling both functional medicine and conventional. And he suspected that I might have some food issues and pointed me toward a rather daunting elimination diet. And I looked at it online and I was like, what the heck? There is no way I'm getting ready to leave town for, um, for work for, uh, that would be three days, very physically challenging for me. I had no time to try and figure out how to eat along the lines of a complete, um, autoimmune, uh, protocol, which is like an, a fully, uh, full elimination diet. So I just said, I'm going to start with gluten. I pretty much think I know what that is like bread and pasta and stuff. And I tell you what, even just doing a, I think these are gluten-free foods kind of thing absolutely changed my life in about 48 hours. Well, it's taken almost 10 years to learn that I had developed autoimmune diseases. Spondyloarthropy was the initial diagnosis. And for a bit, you know, there was a various uh, doctors, especially a couple handful of um, chiropractors that thought, you know, I pretty much had fibromyalgia until I finally got in with a specialist, a rheumatologist who ruled that out. So spondyloarthropy, I like to call it spondy, it's just easier to say, and enthesitis was my joint pain issues. This is simply an inflammatory arthritis and a condition that causes pain where muscles attach to joints. Inflammation is at the root of inflammatory arthritis. So spondy or SPA is much different than osteoarthritis, which does get inflamed. And I also have some osteoarthritis in my joints of my fingers and they do get inflamed, but osteoarthritis is due to wear and tear over time. So the next diagnosis that came is lupus and then maybe rheumatoid, rheumatoid arthritis or RA. And we will actually find that out next month, which would be May of 2021. So we'll, we'll see how that goes. But to be honest, I thought my diet and lifestyle was pretty darn good when I was about 38, but the truth is my body was stressed out. I was unknowingly eating foods that increased inflammation. And frankly, I was working out too hard and too often, and I was too busy. I was stressed out. My candle was burning at both ends and internally. <laughs> I needed to put the flame out or take the medications my rheumatologist was pushing to put the flame out that way. And you know, personally, I was not interested in a life on steroids and the other assortment of drugs. Uh, some of them are, they called them DMARDs, uh, disease modifying drugs uh, that would simply give me so many side effects that even my side effects would be needed to be addressed with a whole other list of pharmaceuticals. <laughs> so I was really looking for and already engaging in a natural um, 
a natural course of action when I got my diagnosis. But let's dial back just a tad. What about my family history? What about your family genes? Well, it turns out that autoimmune disease and dysfunction actually run in my family. My dad has chronic pain as well as chronic fatigue, and so did his dad. These are two things that I just didn't know. But it was my lifestyle that pulled the trigger on those genetic factors. That's what we call epigenetics. It's the influence of lifestyle on our genetic code. I like the way Chris Kresser says it. Your genes are like bullets in your gun. It's your lifestyle that pulls the trigger. Unfortunately, and I can testify by my own experience, that once a person receives an autoimmune diagnosis, the next step in most cases is pharmaceuticals. I literally walked out with a prescription on the day that I received my diagnosis of Spondy and one that I did not fill, but I did spend the next two hours Googling everything I could find on my diagnosis. We were, you know, the rheumatologist is uh, out of town for us and it wasn't good. A disability, you know, misshapen body parts, uh, heart attacks, and even potentially spine fusion dude, I was scared, but I was determined to set a different course. And thankfully I had, and I still have my husband's support. Hi, did you know that the pathforhealth.com has a favorites tab? So often my clients ask me about products that I recommend to them that I went ahead and put some of the products on my favorites tab, whether it's collagen or shakes or vitamins or just like little foods that I found on Amazon or whatever, just things that make clean living and healthy living easier. So if you're interested in checking out some of the products that are tried and tested and true and things that I stand behind, are they absolutely perfect? No, but as I jokingly say, they are brandy approved and you can find all of those products on the pathforhealth.com on the um, favorites tab. Thanks. Here's the rest of your podcast. I tell you what, it's really hard to get into a rheumatologist. They are swamped and there aren't that many of them, you know, spread across the country. Thankfully, we live in California where we do have quite a few here based on our population density. But uh, most of the people uh, that go to a rheumatologist, you know, they're not just autoimmune disease people. They're also people just with allergies. And unfortunately, the only tool in a rheumatologist toolbox is drugs. So what did he do? You know, other than drugs, he did suggest that I look into CBT, that is cognitive behavior therapy for anxiety and depression that often comes with chronic pain and fatigue. But other than that, he did respect my stance on food as medicine. He doesn't necessarily agree. He just smiles and he's waiting to simply see me year after year until I finally get to a point where I will start filling my prescriptions. He is a very kind guy. He's very busy. He takes his time with you. And I really do appreciate how he respects my own personal stance here. But he's been doing this for 30 years and those are his tools. So fortunately, by the time I sat down with this specialist, this rheumatologist, I had already been on the healing trail for a while and had made some amazing progress with diet and lifestyle changes, which included closing my gym, working less hours, and actually becoming a functional nutritional therapy practitioner. I used my own formal education to make a ton of progress. I mean, even while I was in still school, I was kind of using myself as my first patient or client. And, and I mean, I am the way I am today, feeling fully energetic, not 100% pain-free. I don't think I ever will be, but I tell you what, I'm, I'm living like an amazing life and that's what I want for you. Right. But I tell you, I remember, I remember what it was like to just want a name for my issues, you know, and I know I'm not alone on that. To be honest, I actually did want a diagnosis. I wanted to know that it was real and that doctors recognized what was going on and I just didn't have this random list of, you know, symptoms going on in my body. I wanted a name for what was going on. But once I had it, I really pretty much just felt scared, <laughs> you know, and maybe a little overwhelmed when I considered looking at what could be as I went down the road. 
So I'm not alone in how long it took to receive a diagnosis, nor my reaction to it. The average woman, and I meet with these women on a regular basis, uh, usually must wait about four to 10 years. It's, it's, definitely closer to eight to 10 years before they finally get a diagnosis. Why? Well, many women are handed sleeping pills and pain meds and anxiety medication and pretty much told that, you know what, it's the quote unquote change. That's what's going on. The weight gain, the hair loss, the, the insomnia, the anxiety or whatever it is. You know, it's just a stage of life you're in. But I got to tell you, that is BS. Our bodies are changing during those could be up to 10 years of perimenopause and then going into menopause, but not like this. It, it should be and can be a smooth transition for most women. So these women are often made to feel like they did something wrong. Like, you know what? You're so overweight because you know, you're in perimenopause or menopause. Basically what you need to do is take hormones and just accept the fact that this is the stage of life that you're in and quote unquote, eat healthy and, you know, eat less and exercise more kind of a situation. To be honest, nine out of 10 of the clients that I work for, they aren't the ones sitting at Panda Express and drinking six or seven sodas a day. They actually eat pretty darn good. They just don't realize which foods increase inflammation in their bodies and which foods or behaviors are messing up their metabolism and their blood sugar, which results in increased inflammation in their body and gets their hormones wacky and their ability to heal wacky, all of this right? That's what I help women do is figure this giant puzzle out. Why? Because I have done it in my own life and I continue to do it and manage it in my own life. And I want other women to feel as wonderful as I often feel. Now, autoimmune disease, ooh, very complex and often has overlapping issues like pain and fatigue. So when you go in with something like that, you know, con conventional doctors are pretty much looking for a specific deterioration of a joint or an organ. In my case, you know, lupus is about organs and spondyloarthropy, you know, is about um, joints. So sadly, there are very few autoimmune diseases that you just have like a test that says, yep, you've got it or nope, you haven't got it. <laughs> you know, even RA, rheumatoid arthritis requires more than just a positive or elevated rheumatoid factor on a lab slip. Your doctor has to be with you, poke and prod, ask you questions and do other things to get the diagnosis. So whether you have a diagnosis or are seeking one, there's one thing that I remind myself of daily and that I also share with anybody that will listen is a diagnosis may describe who you or describe what is going on with you, but it doesn't define who you are. A diagnosis may describe you, but it doesn't define who you are. I am not lupus or I am not spondy. That's not who I am. But when I tell a doctor or a person that, that I have that diagnosis, then they can go, oh, okay, okay. So now they kind of know what they're dealing with, right? But here's the truth. You have the power and the opportunity to influence the outcome of your health regardless of a diagnosis. If you have a disease, that means you can slow it down or speed it up the, you know, or speed up the progress of your condition based on how you live. So to be honest, I still have hope that my rheumatologist one day will take back his diagnosis. Like, you know what? I think I was wrong. You don't have, you don't have lupus or something like that, but whatever he says, it doesn't really matter because I'm not trying to get certain medications. Once you have a diagnosis, it's like checking a box and it opens up a door, you know, like the key in Alice in Wonderland. Once she had the key, she can go through that door and, you know, have new adventures. I don't want new adventures personally with prescriptions. I am honest and I am open to the fact that someday, regardless of how I live, someday my disease progression may go a little bit faster than what I would like. And I may have to take prescriptions, but I tell you what, I'm going to do everything I can to try and make the best diet and lifestyle choices that are going to nourish my body and not put myself in a higher risk or a, like a fast slope or fast lane to disease progression and be on the other end of the spe spectrum. Some of those searches that I did on Google that just scared me to death.
So what can you do today to either maybe slow the course, maybe, you know, to not trigger your genes or, or maybe even just manage the diagnosis that you already have. So there are many lifestyle choices and practices as well as the actual foods that you eat, um, or the foods that you don't eat that are massive and major influencers that can either lead to wellness or lack of it, AKA sickness. So over the last 12 years, I have observed by trial and error and formal education, the seven pillars of wellness, stress management, food, sleep, community, mental and emotional health, repair and recovery need, and exercise or movement throughout the day. My goal is health. It is wellness restoration so that I can go live the life that I am called by the Lord to live and to live it well. I want to travel, have adventures, and explore this earth with the people that I love. And I want to feel good. And I'm not going to lie. I want to look good while I'm doing it. I want restoration. And I know you do too. And that is how the Restore program was born. I created an acronym to help my students remember the seven pillars of the, of the wellness elements that I just mentioned to you. And the acronym was actually, I believe, inspired by the Holy Spirit when I was in the shower. Total true story. So imagine the word restore, R-E-S-T-O-R-E. That stands for rest, eat, sleep, tribe, open up, repair, and exercise. These are the seven elements that if you can just take tiny steps or make really small, consistent improvements in these seven areas, you will start seeing improvements in your overall health and wellness. So I was certainly not managing rest or stress when my health came to a crossroads. My eating was inflammatory, even though I didn't know it. I didn't know what gluten and and dairy was doing to me. I didn't know what nightshades were doing to me. You know, my sleep was awful, but I thought it was just perimenopause. My community of people that I hung out with definitely needed to be improved. I had all sorts of stuff on my mind and my heart after losing our home in 2008 or 9 uh, during the financial crash that our nation faced that cut my husband's pay drastically uh, because of the furloughs that were running across our state. Uh, even though his work hours for the state were increasing and demanding, you know, law enforcement just didn't, they didn't get days off, like, like days cut. They just got their pay cut. That was really hard on us. Um, it led to us actually losing our home. Our oldest son left for the army and was engaged in a lot of combat in Afghanistan. And at the same time, I had no idea when, when everything was snowballing with my health, I didn't know how to repair or fix myself, especially once I knew that I had gut issues and hormone issues, the hair falling out. And frankly, I was overdoing it in the exercise area. I, I thought that it was helping. It was the only thing that really made me feel good and strong and free, but really it was just like too much on me. My body, my life was inflamed. 70% of inflammatory reactions are determined by factors over which we have some measure of control. Stress management practices, healing diets, reduced exposure to toxic pollutants can all be addressed so as not to trigger those genetic predispositions that we all have. Remember what Chris Kresser says, genetic issues are just like bullets in your gun. If you know diabetes or you know certain things like Alzheimer's or in your family tree, then you really are at an advantage. We need to focus on lowering your level of inflammation in your body. My cry to you is to not wait. All of the things that I was dealing with and 99% of the things that my clients are dealing with, they're downstream effects from inflammation. Don't wait. Don't settle for the excuse that this is your age or your family tree. Take the reins and take charge of all seven pillars of wellness. Rest, eat, sleep, tribe, open up, repair, and exercise. Take small steps and 
you, your whole life can change. I'm telling you, I'm living it. I'm feeling it. I know it seems like a lot. I mean, really, you know, it's not as massive, as overwhelming as it seems. Trust me. I know I, I, I contribute to a lot of the information, the wellness information that is out there in the education and all of it is, that can be overwhelming. Like, where do I start? I'm going to tell you where to start right now. I want you to focus on eating whole, clean foods that are nutrient dense, in season, local if you can, properly raised or harvested in a natural and non-toxic ancient kind of way, right? Cows grazing out in the pasture, (laughs) eating what cows should eat, you know, making sure that your foods are low in sugar and starch, as well as avoiding toxic oils and, and processed oils and refined fats and chemicals and all of that. So eat clean, whole foods. 75% of your plate should be veggies, non-starchy veggies, 75% in volume, 75%. You know, meat should be like a little condiment, not like the main star. I think Dr. Hyman calls it condiment. I totally love that. You know, four to six ounces, you know, each meal, whether you're eating your two to three meals away, that's all you need. Make sure that you take time to prioritize your sleep, unplug, dim the lights, go to bed by nine or 10 at night to achieve seven to eight and a half hours of sleep. Wake up with the sun, go outside as soon as you can in the morning, get the sky on your face. Let your brain know how to set your circadian rhythm for life when you're awake, when you're tired. This helps with hormones. This helps with insomnia. Don't forget to move your body throughout the day, my friend not just in one intense session, two to three times a week. It's, it's more about the quality movement, the consistent movement that you can do little movement snacks or fitness snacks throughout the day. You know, I'll finish doing this podcast. Um, I'll, you know, take a drink of water and I'll go out and take a short walk. Even if it's five minutes, it makes a huge difference. Take time to walk in nature, meditate, pray, even journal nourish your emotional and mental health rather than just distract it all the time with social media, with scrolling, with all of these things and, and, and stuffing our feelings and until they pop up like a balloon or pop like a balloon or that they feel like a weight around our neck, deal with your mental and emotional and spiritual health, be intentional about it. And if need be get help and guidance when it comes to repairing and balancing your body, your mind, your spirit, or your soul. There's a system doing this. There's an order to healing that goes far beyond just getting rid of bad foods and eating good food. It's not just about eating less and moving more. It's not. This is especially important for people with autoimmune disease. Just trying fasting isn't enough. Fasting's great. I'm, I'm, I'm fasting right now. It's absolutely great. But there's other things that we need to do with it if you're looking for restoration. Change your scenery if you must. Spend time with people that are like-minded in the wellness department. Change your community. Enjoy life. Celebrate it. Don't let it become a day-in, day-out kind of thing. Wake up every morning. Today is going to be a great day. Say it out loud, even if you don't mean it. Smile. Your feet hit hit the floor. Today is going to be a great day. Embrace the life that you have and find gratitude even in the small things like the roof over your head and the food in your house. Those aren't as small as you think, my friend. The things that our society and socioeconomic takes for granted just is crazy. So if you need a little kickstart to get going, I have all sorts of freebies that can help you out. Just go to my website, uh, thepathforhealth.com. There's a seven-day kickstart um, video series on there that walks you through a seven day journey of kind of cleaning things up with some downloads in there and some little talks by me. Um, I even have a free ebook that addresses clean eating for women over 40, kind of working with your faith and, and your health. And Hey, if you can, don't forget to join my free Facebook group, you know, called women over 40, restoring our health and faith. Do it. We'd love to have you. It's a great community for women who are all working on creating wellness in their lives. So my friend, my sister on this wellness path, thank you so much for listening to my story today. I hope it resonates with you. I hope, I hope that there was a few, you know what, that's me too moments in there receiving a diagnosis isn't quite what we all thought it would be in terms of relief because we finally have that answer. 
And remember, a diagnosis may describe you, my friend, but it certainly doesn't define who you are and the plans that the Lord has for you. He does have plans for you. And I highly doubt it is from going from doctor appointment to doctor appointment. You, he needs you to be out in the world spreading the light. And you get to do that when you work on your wellness and you make these small changes. It's not the broad sweeping stuff. You get to do that. You get to help create or write the roadmap of your life with the Lord. Just remember, restore, rest, eat, sleep, tribe. That's your community. Open up, repair, and exercise. You don't have to make major changes, just tiny steps, just small changes that eventually grow into bigger ones that can help you gain momentum. That's the key. And keep listening. Make sure you subscribe. Make sure you share my podcast, comment on it, review it for me so that more women can find it and be on the lookout. I have some podcasts coming up um, on behavior change and some tools that can really help you out. So make sure you subscribe to the newsletter. I always have great uh, small content in there that, that with action steps for you. But thank you so much. So this is Brandy Lloyd. And I thank you so much for listening to the Restore Path podcast. See you soon. Mm-hmm.